welcome to the fourth episode of the Grassroots Football Coach Podcast, brought to you by Barts and Bucks FA. On this episode, Rivo is joined by Martin Sinclair. Martin is a coach with a Saints ability and also represents England's cerebral palsy team. Martin discusses the disability pathway, including his own experiences growing up. They discuss the first time they met at Plymouth Argyle, London 2012 achievements, as well as Martin's preference on coaching styles. He also talks about why he prefers Klopp and Pep and touches on the importance of video analysis. A quick reminder before the pod starts that if you haven't done so already, please subscribe and you'll receive every new podcast to your device as soon as it's released. So sit back, enjoy what is a fantastic and inspiring episode with Martin Sinclair. Hello, I'm here with Martin Sinclair, a um, good friend of mine going back some time, football coach. England CP international player and Martin's joined me today just to talk about his coaching career, his playing career to date. So welcome Martin. How are you doing Mark? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Um, so for those who don't know you, can you just give us a brief uh, description of, of where you are currently, where you've come from in terms of your playing and coaching career? So uh, my name is Martin Sinclair. I'm a Saints Ability Development Officer at the Saints Foundation. So I'm, I look at um, opportunity, opportunities for talented players to play elite disability football to get players, young players, into the England pathway. Brilliant. How are you finding the role and uh, the role as a coach transferring from uh, a player, as I've known you for the last few years? How are you finding the coaching side of it? Yeah, I oversee two um, development centres, one for the talent hub for seven to 16 year olds for cerebral palsy, partially sighted and hearing impairment and the adult section as well to go into um, people going into um, the England pathway also. But if they can't get into that England pathway, then we've set up a, a volunteer package for them to um, represent the Saints Foundation into our disability programme and also have the benefits side of things to going on their level one or their level two coaching course. Brilliant. Um, so let's just rewind a little bit and let's start with you as a player. So we first met probably ooh, 2005, I would have said, down at Plymouth Argyle. Was long that right? time, long time. It was a long time ago. And um, I remember having a knock on my door from Ian Holloway. And we had uh, your brother Scott Sinclair on loan at the time, I believe. And uh, Ian said, we've, we've got Scott's brother who we want to get down here. And um, he's a player, he's a coach. They can do everything, basically. <laughs> um, you've got to get him in somehow. Um, so then we had a chat and I met you. And then um, I think it's probably fair to say you weren't playing an awful lot then. No, no. I, it, was, it was a rough time for me because um, I was in that hospital for um, nearly eight years um, with a hip replacement and also lost um, one of my good mates from drowning. So I just needed to get back into a football environment. And it didn't matter if it was football or coaching, it was just to try and get a smile back on my face and uh, have the confidence and self-esteem back. Yeah, and Plymouth Argyle at the time had um, a, a, a very big, very successful disability programme. Um, I think they trained a couple of times a week and played matches and then you just seemed to slot in there seamlessly, um, got in their team and then before we knew it, you were representing England. How did that come about? It was, it was like I said before, it was just to start off um, going down the train and just to have a smile on my face just to get the, um, back into football, which um, I love. So um, I used to train, um, we used to travel from Bath to Plymouth, um, every Friday to um, start training and then um, found out there was a disability um, side down there for um, Plymouth Isle Girls. So we got in for the trial, um, got represented and then we trained, um, probably played a game every month. And then usually um, at the end of the year, um, the Plymouth Foundation community um, has a, um, a rep side to play at the home park. Yeah. And then I got selected to play at home park and then found out there was an England scout um, watching the game. So from there, I didn't even know there was an England cell palsy team um, for 20, um, 23 years of my life. I, I didn't mm. think there was an exit route for um, people mm. who had cerebral palsy, especially playing for your country as well. That's fantastic. I didn't actually know that that was the case, that there was someone in the stand. Um, as you know, my eldest son has cerebral palsy and it's a passion of mine. And, and, and we're talking today about planning for a coaches conference, etc. And I just think it needs to get out there a little bit more in terms of exit routes. Where do 
are players that have um, a variety of disabilities. Where do they go? What are the exit routes for, the, for these players? And um, it's great that we've got someone like you, a role model for the sport, who's gone on and represented their country and has you know, got a fantastic story to tell. To inspire, to inspire others as well. Yeah, this it's probably the best way um, forward for me to come to this um, conference um, to showcase ability rather than disability and people focus on um, rather what they couldn't do and what, what, and what they can do. And, and that, as coaches, it's, that's what it's all about, is finding um, a platform and an environment just to make sure they, um, they are confident, they have got self-esteem, they have um, got self-belief. And from there, they, you can promote the exit routes and give um, grassroots coaches the, the knowledge of um, disability or especially the elite disability pathway and if not they're, they're, then there's an environment into um, mainstream setup as well Brilliant, so let's just continue talking about your, your playing career as well so what were your sort of highlights, I'm guessing it would be representing your country, um, have you got any, any things that stand out? Yeah, so um, London 2012 um, was quite a big year for me as well not only me but um, the whole family because we um, made history as a family, um, me and my brother were the first brothers in history to make it in the same sport, Olympics and Paralympics. So walking out of 80,000 people um, in the open ceremony. Wow. Um, I remember. Shouting Team GB was yeah. a highlight of my playing career as well. And it's probably the biggest highlight from, um, from today. Fantastic. Um, in terms of sort of role models in coaching, um, Who's been some of the people that have inspired you to coach over the years? So it's probably um, the first um, manager who, um, who coached me, and that was Lyndon Lynch. He was a very good man management um, um, style. We probably didn't have the best um, on the um, training side of things, but he knew how to get people um, motivated and get yeah. people playing in, in the right way on, um, when we're playing um, for England as well. And that's probably nowadays you see more management, um, man management um, from the top level to the bottom level as well. You see yeah. Jurgen Klopp, um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and um, Guario to get people um, more man, man, man management around. And then you yeah. see people, it's like, for example, Sterling, look at where he is now, stri just striving and from where he was before, it's Guario has made him a better player, yeah. and not only in a football term, but personally as well. Yeah, that's in, um, interesting. Is there anyone else, Martin, that springs to mind in terms of um, coaches that have aided your development over the years? Um, probably um, the guy sat next to me is probably um, <laughs> um, Mark Mark, uh, Mark Rivers. So yeah, you were probably. I wasn't probing yeah. you for that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it so, now, but yeah. So you were um, obviously you gave me a, um, a way in for um, getting me back on my feet uh, in a coaching community in, in the summer holidays, and that's where I probably got my passion back from um, into coaching, want to develop further, not only in a mainstream um, environment, but in a disciplined environment as well. So thank you, Mark. Brilliant. Yeah, oh, no problem. Um, it's good that we've stayed in touch over the years as well. What about in the, in the modern game, in the professional game? Is there anyone um, that you think, do you know what, I like, I like their style, I like the way they go about things. You mentioned man management. Um, I look at the uh, Pep Guardiola's and, and, and Mourinho's and managers like that that have probably inspired me over the years. What about yourself? Nice. Okay, I'm a Man U fan, so it'd probably be um, Guardiola <laughs> and um, Klopp just to see um, players playing with a smile on their face and happy that they can cross that white line and do mm. whatever we want to do and try and um, score goals and not and just have the freedom to, to mm. play football. Mm. Um, and it's all about when you get on that pitch, it's, it's, it's all about having a smile on your face. And it doesn't matter if you... Obviously, it's a competitive level from um, in the Premiership and... Um, the, um, being a pro as well but having a smile on your face playing you, you, you're you going to get more rewards on that as well and you'll be, yeah. a, be a, a better footballer mm. from that um, So the people I interview for this podcast we go through we call it the sort of three th thirds really a defensive third midfield third and a final third so one, one of the questions on here just sort of reverse back to um, a coaching philosophy and a coaching style um, so you as Martin Sinclair, the coach now, is there any particular way um, if you're managing a, a team that you'd like them 
to play as such? What would your Martin Sinclair coaching and playing philosophy look like? From where I am now is probably like a, a skill development um, base to get um, players um, better, better, not only as footballers, but as people as well. Um, and then we can follow the exit routes with the disability side of things and the um, exit routes of the England pathway. And then they've got a better chance to maintain and um, when they get into the um, first team with disabilities, they're mentally ready, um, not phys um, football ready, but mentally ready at the same time. Yeah. So they don't need to drop back down. So for me, it's getting pe um, players um, be better. I'll j just touch it on that, actually. What, what would you say the like, fundamental differences from, let's say, playing with Primafar goals, disabilities set up to then going on international duty with England? What are some of the things... You know, if players were going to make that sort of transition, that that um, you might give them some advice on. So, from from when I was at Plymouth, there was not enough, there wasn't uh, any video analysis on what on the team, yeah. how the team was, was set up, or um, the way um, Graham wanted us to play. So he just wanted us to just to um, play football. But in the top level now, is when I'm um, playing back for England, it's more video analysis on um, where not where to go, but the dangerous environment, or what what you could do better as a uh, individual and as a team base. What could you do better? And there's more um, Q and A yeah. um, around it as well to find out your solution of get, getting out of it, not just the coaches, because the coaches can't. Um, they only can do the fundamentals of laying the team mm. out as uh, tactically as well. Is but but if it does go wrong, wrong on the pitch, it's down to you as an individual and down to you as um, a player with all your teammates to find solutions and get the way out of it. That, that's excellent, and I didn't expect anything less to be honest. And you know. When I deliver on the coaching courses, the FA Level 1s, 2s, the UEFA Bs, something we talk about quite a lot is different coaching styles and how players are different. And, uh, you know, you've alluded to it then. Uh, some players need a bit more on the sort of motivational side, man management side. Um, because we're, we're all different and we, we learn in completely different ways. So, you know, the fact that it's not... All uh, an, an auditory style, like I've said many a times on these podcasts before, my coach was very auditory and would just tell me exactly what he wanted from me. I didn't have to think at all. There was no free expression. There was no room for creativity. Um, it was just him telling me what to do. So the fact that you're saying that there was loads of question and answer, you know, almost you guys go and solve the puzzle, you go and work it out. Um, within a, 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 a way that the coach wanted to play a system, if you like, but you've got free expression within that. That's, um, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, so, you know, now um, we're leading up to the World Cup for um, with England. Um, Andy, um, our gaffer, at, um, now is um, doing our match prep um, for the next... Um, for the World Cup in June, end of June, and um, and yeah, he's he's given us uh, a format to play, but it's 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 down to us as players and to find solutions on how we how we can get um, transfer that on the pitch. So when will you meet? So I'm guessing you'll have a, a camp nearer the time, and you'll meet. And how long is that for? So usually it's. Um, once or twice a month um, for when we um, go up to St George's and um, do our do our training sessions with England South Wolsey team and then we'll probably do some games alongside that I know um, Ireland and USA are coming down um, to play us as well so that would be good match preparation not only getting good ma um, preparation on the tra um, training ground but also doing matches as well to facilitate um, the um, plan of action of what we want to try and do for the World Cup going forward. Brilliant. And you're probably a, um, a veteran of that team now, <laughs> of the, C the England the CP oldest, team. Probably the oldest. Yeah. So do you um, get involved in, or do you have an input in, in, in coaching along the way? Do you have a say in tactics and strategies? No, no, no. So, yeah, no, no, we don't. So, um, Andy um, and Jeff Davis is um, 
and Jane Buck, our sports psychologist, is set up a, um, a leadership group, and I'm part of that leadership group. Fantastic. Um, for the, not um, not just the young players, but the older players um, as well, just to, um, how they're doing, the morale's doing, what what needs to improve, what we need to do, um, and it's like I said before, it's getting the best solutions on how we can do um, better, not as an individual, but as a team as well. When we go forward into the World Cup, and especially. Um, being with each other for three weeks, what can we do for the downtime? What can we do to have a bit of fun? Because sometimes when you get into a tournament-based situation, your minds mm. um, go sometimes, and mm. that's where our older lads and all the leadership group you can um, get a few activities going just to get the morale up and um, and just to put a smile on their face and that they're, they're enjoying the tournament football because it does get a bit boring. Brilliant. Just, just give us an insight on those camps in terms of the downtime, what sort of things that you'd sort of get up to because um, we don't really see that as the general public when, when any of the teams train. Um, but there will be a lot of downtime, a lot of time off the pitches. What sort of things would you do to keep yourselves entertained? So, yeah, so if, if players, new players come in, they have to do a, like a song initiation for the uh, first time or yeah. um, we do we do some quizzes or do some table tennis or um, bowling we done um, yeah. when we were away in um, for the Euros just to get a bit or have a little walk to the shops, just, to, uh, just a yeah. bit of social, just to get away from football because football's not everything. Yeah. Yeah, um, especially now when you've got such, such uh, mental health around it with not just... Um, football but other sports as well is mm. finding that downtime just away from football yeah no really good point um so i just want to touch on some differences in your opinion from when you were um a young lad growing up and first became interested in football to now what are some of the fundamental differences that you noticed in the game whether it be playing or coaching oh when i was younger i got kicked out of football teams because um, so I had a disability. Everyone looked wow. at what I can't do rather than what I can do. And I got I got banned for two months from the local FA just because I was disabled. So now there's more awareness on um, um, disabilities, but not just disabilities, but mental health as well. So everyone has different struggles in life and mm -hmm. um, everyone has different strengths and weaknesses and now it's time for coaches and society as well to focus on the strengths and rather the weaknesses and, mm. and that's the way we should go forward is it, and showcasing the ability it doesn't matter how if you want to play at the top game or, or, the, or just finding having friends um, playing about with um, having a smile on your face it doesn't matter mm. that's what um, football does to you and that's how powerful sport is so where do you think we are as a as a nation now then with in terms of disability football? I still, it's still not out there because I think you still see, now you f find now, most of our um, England Serval Palsy players are playing semi-professional football. Mm. And people's got a stigma of, if I say I play for England Serval Palsy, is, oh, you can't play football. But look mm. at the standard. Yeah. We are, um, we're playing seven a side game, no offsides. We're probably playing from, if you're narrowing it down, you're from 11 a side pitch, you're probably playing from 18 yard box to 18 yard box with no, no offsides. So we yeah. have to be fit. Yeah. And people will be shocked on um, the level standard of the, um, the game as well. Mm. Um, and they'll probably be better noticed of um, players around when, oh, I know people who's got CP, they've got an exit or, or deaf or blind. More people knowing about what um, disabilities or did the disability um, pathway, mm. there's more chance for, uh, as a nation society, to um, get the um, power of the sport back. Fantastic. A um, couple more before we move on. I'm just going to go, we've got some quick fire questions. Oh, um, here we go. Yeah. So, one word answers, if you can. Yeah. Um, if you need to elaborate a little bit more, I'll let you. And you can, you can give your reasons for it as well. So, this is a tough one. The first one is Guardiola, Guardiola or Mourinho? Easy. Guardiola. Okay. 
Any substance behind that? Any reasons why? It's just because I, I love the way um, Man City play football. Um, obviously, Mourinho's been um, a great um, asset for, um, for winning trophies and, and his playing style of winning trophies because he's a born winner. But the way the game's going now is um, the beautiful game. Quality is right up there for me. Mm. I agree, and I know I said one-word answers, but it is quite difficult to um, to not elaborate on things like that. Um, I'd have to go Guardiola as well. I mean, a few years ago, I wouldn't be able to look past Mourinho, but the things that Pep has done, I think, on and off the pitch, not only his strategy, the way that he wants to play, and the way that he sort of religiously sticks to that, um, but also, if you've seen the TV programme with him as well, the, um, the sort of man management side, the way he motivates players, I think... If I was ever good enough to play in a team like that, that would be someone who would motivate me and make me run onto that pitch and, and um, do my best for him. So, no, I, I 100% agree. Uh, and as well, to elaborate, the perfect example is Paul Pogba. When he was under Mourinho, you didn't really see any um, potential. And now, now um, you see um, him playing over he's under social. He's striving because yeah, yeah, he's yeah. got a smile on his face and he's loving what he's doing. Yeah. So this might lead into the next one. So in terms of um, a coaching uh, strategy, a way of playing, would you prefer your teams to play build-up play through the thirds or a direct style of football? Easy way to go again, build-up through the thirds. I, 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 like I said, it's just that's how football should go. It, depending on the situation with um, the teams, um, Dependent, yeah, what teams I'm playing, but most of all, probably 95% will be um, building for them. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is interesting because you've touched on this one as well. But this number three is question and answer or a command style of coaching. Q and A. Yeah, I do honestly think that that's the way the game's growing. And um, like, for example, you see more players if they're doing Q and A are more prone to going into the um, coaching world when they when they finish. And if you're doing a, a commanding style, well, so sometimes you will have to do a commanding style depending on yep. the, um, the situation. But I think if you're trying to get um, uh, your point across, it's probably more of a Q&A than a command style. OK. Um, constant practices, so like the old-fashioned drills, if you like. Me pass to you, you stop it, you pass it back. Um, versus random practices, so practices that are closer to the game? Probably random practices mm -hmm. as well, but like I said, we'll probably go back to um, what level you're, um, you're facilitating with um, the age groups. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to do that, that style for um, people who get basic style for people who want to get into um, who's just starting playing football and the starter pack as well. So... Um, but for me, it's it's the second one. Yeah, and and that's something that comes up a lot of all the coaches. It's you know, for me personally, I love the random style, whole part whole, let them play as much as they can. But at times, there's going to be revert back to the constant practices. And the professionals do it. You know, just after their warm up in training, they'll do some constant stuff before they go into their phases of play, etc. Definitely. Um, so. Stop, stand still style of coaching or individual drive-bys to get your messages on? So um, it's probably both. I can't really pick because now um, I'm back playing. Um, there's sometimes you can get away with individual um, drive-bys. But with if you want to... If we're focusing on a game, you probably need to do a stop stand deal still to get, get your point across as what, well. OK, then what do you prefer as a player from a coach to stop you um, and stop everyone to make a point? So you stopped, they illustrate their point and then, you know, that might take a couple of minutes and let you play. Or maybe just to pull you out as the session's still going on to make a quick point to you, 20, probably, 30 yeah, seconds. It, yeah, you're probably right. So it, um, it's probably an individual um, drive by. Well, if you think that probably when we started playing, it would have generally been a more more stop-stand-still approach. Everyone stop. Maybe just to make a point to one player or one specific unit. Yeah. Um, another example of how the game's evolved. Um, OK, passers or dribblers? <laughs> <laughs> That's a toughie, man. That's a toughie because 
I loved um, Ronaldinho went back in the day and Ronaldo as well but when you've got um, exactly going back to the Guardia days with Barcelona Xavi and Iniesta they didn't even have to dribble past a player they just mm. had to find space and do a, like a one touch tic tac football so mm. I can't I can't decide on that tough one, one isn't it tough one um, Premier League or La Liga <laughs> Um, that's a toughie, Mark. I probably would have to say Premier League because I, I I watch it every week. But yeah. so, some of the games I do watch for La Liga, you know, and technically they are they are ballers. They are yeah. absolute ballers. And it's like when when I was younger, when I was about um, eight nine years old, if you said to a um, four or five. English, um, it's that mentality is that, oh, we'll just set up the goals up and have a game. Mm. But if that was like an intercontinental um, football, they'd just have little um, passing drills and stuff like that. That's how I remembered um, mm. when I was growing up. Like mm. The English mentality was all about, oh, let's play a game, let's play a game, let's put the jumpers down and play mm. a game. And then you see the people from um, the foreign players who are just have little, let's work on our technic um, mm. technical stuff. So... You, I, I agree with you. I think Premier League, and that's what I've grown up with, and I do think it's the best league in the world for entertainment, and just it's just got everything for me. And with the influx of foreign players, do you think that's that's aided our game at the top level in this country? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Especially when you, um, when I was younger, and see the likes of Eric Cantona and Dennis Bergkamp, and then Robert Piers and Mark Overmars, and then you see the game grow, growing again with um, mm. Cristiano Ronaldo and stuff like that, and then you see Didier Dropper and and people like that, it's it, the, the game has grown massively and, and it's obviously because the foreign players are coming. Mm. I think we just need to, to have a look nowadays at how players in the Premier League control the ball. There's a lot that's derived from futsal as well. Um, look at the style of goalkeeping. If you look at David De Gea, um, one of my favourite goalkeepers, how he, um, the shapes that he creates to block shots, which is derived from futsal as well. So... That's all helped again. And that's again. what we're doing as well for the England CT, um, CP team as well, mm. is incorporating um, the futsal elements to um, our seven-a-side game as well. Brilliant. So. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for answering those, Martin. And um, so tell us what you're, what you're currently doing. I know you've got a new business venture um, on the horizon and you've got your business partner here with us today, Mark. Yeah, he's going to go through um, the um, business plan, so I'll pass you over to Mark. <laughs> Welcome, Mark. Hi, Mark. You okay? Yeah, very well, thank you. So what's this new venture then that you and Martin have got in store for us? Um, so about six months ago, this came up. Um, me and Martin have worked at the foundation now for um, just over two years. Um, and uh, I've, I've played at non-league level up to Conference South, so I've made a, quite a lot of contacts in the game. Lots of my, my close friends now play professional football. Um, Martin, obviously, with the, the family connection um, and the contacts that he's made him himself, um, we decided to um, look at setting up a, a sports management company. So basically looking at... I don't like the term agent, so mm. I'd like to think of us as player consultants. Um, mm. I think it's a bit more personal like that. So, yeah, that's our that's our business. Fantastic. So, um, by the time this podcast comes out, I'm sure you'll be uh, well on your road, well on the road in terms of um, your business and where you're at with it. But um, what what are your sort of plans just to get yourself off, off the ground and running um so obviously we've we've had various meetings over the last kind of um couple of months um we've been up and down the country putting a lot of miles in the car speaking yeah. to various people which is the advice we've taken from people who've who've started businesses like these um we've created a a business plan between three to five years um about where we see things going um and you know the what we want to do is provide a, a first-class service and, a, and an honest service because I think it's it's very it's common knowledge that there's a lot of scrutiny with agents um, in this country and, and certainly abroad as well in terms of how they they act and how they represent themselves, but the mm. the, the families and, and the football players. So mm. I think we want to do it right by the football player and their families as well mm. um, and provide the the best experience and the best opportunities that we possibly can for those players that we've got. So. We are looking at targeting quite a lot of non-league players that we, we, we know are currently excelling in their leagues and could probably 
play a lot higher than where they are. Mm. And it's just about people getting chances as well in the game. It's about providing those players with the chances to do that, giving them the platform to to perform, and then we we manage them through that. I mean, Martin's mentioned already about the mental health at present. It's obviously a, a huge mm. issue uh, nationwide and in in various forms of life. Um, and I think it's something that needs to be looked at in, in more detail about how we support football players who have that rejection, you know, from from whether that's a 16-year-old scholar or, you know, as, a, as an 18-year-old and not being given the chance to, to go further or being released at that stage or even as, a, as an under-23. Um, I think it's really important that those management companies, like ourselves, manage those football players who, who have had that rejection as well. So mm. I think it's exceptionally important and it's something we're, we're going to work really hard to make sure that, that we provide that. Interesting, brilliant, Mark. And you mentioned in our chat um, ahead of doing this podcast about like football development opportunities and potentially academies and college programmes. How do you see all that linking in? I think it's it's one of those things when we set this business up, we talked about the academy staff and we talked about either doing that first and then doing the top end of it, i.e. providing the players with the opportunities to go into the pro game. But I think we're going to try and do it the other way around. Um, okay. So we're going to provide, uh, we're going to tr- obviously get football players uh, the to come and sign for us um, to our sports management company and then once we get success from that I think you can then use those success stories to then promote a structured football academy probably looking at different sites around the south um, and we could potentially look at a program where we have a 16 to 18 year old b type program um, along with providing that elite coaching um, and those opportunities regularly for those those kids that have mm. been released and rejected for mental health support um, and also then provide them that, that opportunity and that platform again to go and excel at a professional football club um, to show that there are second chances out there and mm. that's what we'd like to do so um, my experience of doing that at Southampton Football Club I think will stand us in good stead of doing that um, mm. and something that I, I definitely think would would be beneficial and definitely definitely feasible having success from from the top end of, of the business where we provide the opportunity for someone to make it as a professional mm. footballer. Fantastic and I know it's really 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 early days for you um, in terms of getting the business off the ground but have you had any plans in terms of expansion how far you want to go because obviously um, we're predominantly box and bucks so can you see yourself expanding coming over the border uh what border having said that yeah because you, you're kind of based in hampshire aren't you yeah think, you. um so i guess you know the 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 answer has to be that to do this properly you've got to expand your provision as as far as as you need um and as far as it allows you to do so you know we've 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 got a few players that up north of, of, of Manchester, Yorkshire, um, obviously Scottish connections as well. I'm from Northern Ireland myself, so uh, potentially got some Northern Irish connections. So in theory, I don't think it's that we're putting a restriction on it. I think it's just a case of, you know, people will hopefully see the success and see the values of what we will bring to, to them as, a, as an athlete. Um, and yeah, potentially we, we, we could end up in in a European market you just never know <laughs> yeah well brilliant I wish you um, both every success um, Martin we look forward to seeing you in the uh, the coaches conference in June on June the 15th hopefully this podcast will come out before then um, if it comes out after then congratulations well done <laughs> on a good performance <laughs> and hopefully we'll catch up with you again sometime thank you thanks A fantastic listen that was thanks to Martin for sharing his experiences with Ribbo as you would have heard Martin talks about the disability pathway and what opportunities are available at Barts and Bucks FA we have a disability pathway available to view on our website and should you need any further information please contact our disability football development officer John Coles who will be able to support and offer guidance to you we will put his contact details on the notes of this episode so once again thank you so much to Martin and Ribbo for their time on episode five, we have F8 Regional PE Coordinator Lawrence Locke sharing his thoughts with Rivo. So once again, please subscribe if you haven't done so already, and we'll see you real soon. Take care. Hey, I see it, boy.